Welcome everyone to tonight's event. Um, this is from around the world to Columbus, bringing home taste of place. Uh, my name is Mark Anthony Arsenio. I am the um, chapter leader for Slow Food Columbus, as well as the uh, lecture series team leader for Ohio State APOP. And it's wonderful to have um, everyone joining us tonight. Um, as I'd mentioned earlier to the group, we've got about 50 folks or so registered. So we'll see who shows up um, and I hope you're able to enjoy uh, the evening. Um, what I'd like to do is just start with a brief overview and welcome to, to folks just who may not be familiar with um, APOP or Slow Food Columbus. And as I do that, I'd like to invite Lee to unmute. Hello, can you um, hear me? Does that work? I can hear you, yeah. If you can um, go ahead and introduce Ohio State APOP for us. Um, Absolutely, sure. It's my pleasure. And I want to say thank you so much for doing this, Mark Anthony. This is always such a really fun series. Um, so for those of you who are not as familiar with APOP, we are an all-volunteer group that works out of Ohio State. So APOP stands for um, Anthropology Public Outreach Program. So we do all sorts of different events around Columbus. So you might see us at libraries sometimes. We've, we've kind of cut down a lot on the live events since COVID, but we're hoping to bring those back sometime soon, fingers crossed. But over the last few years, we've been doing events at libraries, we've been doing pub talks, we've been um, at COSI. We've been doing events at schools, basically, you know, any time there's an opportunity to talk to people about anthropology, we are there and we really wanna share what we find super cool. Um, so yeah, please keep an eye out if you are interested in these kinds of events. We'd love for you to follow us on social media. You can follow us at Ohio State APOP. Uh, we're on, I believe, Instagram and Facebook. And yeah, if anyone ever has questions or wants to know more, please feel free to reach out to me or Mark Anthony. Um, my address is oldershaw.1 at osu.edu. <laughs> you can also awesome. get on the web, like if you just Google OSU APOP, you can like find contact information, stuff like that. Awesome. Thanks so much, Lee. And Ohio State APOP is also on Twitter as well. So, oh, thank um, you. <laughs> depending on what social media platform you're on, um, feel free to uh, join APOP. And thanks again to Lee for just at the last minute. I meant to email you earlier and, and ask for you to speak. So, I very much no worries happy. at all. <laughs> Always we're happy. Making it through the semester. Huh? Um, we're making it through the semester, so thanks yeah. so much. All right, um, and then for those who aren't familiar with Slow Food Columbus, um, we're seeking to create dramatic and lasting change toward a more sustainable food system and all the wonderful things you can see on screen. You can also check us out at slowfoodcolumbus.org or if you point your phone at the QR code, you'll be brought to um, our series of events that are coming up. We're on um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and then we'll plan to post the event tonight on YouTube along, which is there alongside all of the other lecture series. Um, and then for those who don't know, uh, Slow Food Columbus really focuses on three pillars, good, clean, and fair. So food that is good for you, good that is healthy and, and tastes good, food that is clear, clean for the environment, and then food that is fair for both the producer and the consumer and working to bridge that gap. Um, and so these are the, the three things we focus on. A lot of that ha happens to um, work really well within a local sustainable food setting, um, like what we're gonna hear about tonight, um, but not necessarily including that. Um, so the, the range is quite wide. And so with that context in mind, um, we're gonna just jump right in and I'll have um, our speakers uh, basically introduce themselves and then we'll go into an open discussion with our panelists. Um, I've got some questions here as well. For those who are present, if you have questions um, and you're comfortable in this recorded setting to appear on screen and ask a question live, or you can um, just put your question in the chat and I'll um, feed those questions into our panelists as well. I'll also mention that toward the bottom of your screen, you should see a button um, that says CC for closed captioning. Um, so there's a live um, closed caption feature available. It's not the most accurate thing in the world, um, but it is there um, hopefully to be something better than nothing. All right, and with that in mind, um, I'd like to, let's see, I'll ask, uh, I think Charlotte and Charlotte's unmuted. So we'll have um, Charlotte introduce herself um, and then we'll have Avishar introduce himself. And then um, at this moment in time, we're not sure yet if Jessica is gonna be able to join us um, just with st uh, staffing logistical issues. It's a little bit more difficult um, than we anticipated um, for her to join us. So we'll see if she's able to um, jump in on the call. Um, so Charlotte, uh, assuming that uh, the text working correctly, I'll turn it over to you if you can just, again, introduce yourself, um, where you fit into um, La Chatelaine, and then, um, yeah, just give us some background of who you are. 
so bonjour everyone or bonsoir because after five so we say bonsoir um my name is charlotte harden i am um the owner of the chatelaine french bakery and bistro uh with my family um it is a family-run business we've been uh open since 1991. uh the original la chatelaine opened in up arlington then a year later we opened worthington and then 15 years ago yesterday we opened dublin um, it is a true family-run business. My brothers, uh, my mom and dad, who are slowly trying to retire, uh, my husband, and even all of my nieces and nephews work with us. Um, so it's three generations. Um, we came to America in 1980, 1986. I was uh, six and a half years old. Um, and we've traveled all over the United States and then um, settled here in Columbus, which I'm sure I'll talk about it, why later on. But um, so that's who we are, and and uh, we love to bring some French food to um, to Columbus. So, merci. <laughs> Excellent, Charlotte. I um, mean, we'll turn it over to Avishar. Yeah. Oh. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I've got the, the dairy <laughs> in the throat. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Avishar. Uh, I've been in Columbus for thirty. How old am I? 35? 34 years of my life. I uh, spent a year in New York City, went to Ohio State, graduated in the class of 2009, uh, then took a year to figure out my life like everyone else does. Uh, went from the pre-med slash medicine path to cooking, and uh, here I am. So trying to figure out the business thing now after many, many years of cooking. It seems like uh, if you cook for 10 years, it doesn't matter, but if you show up on TV for seven weeks, everyone knows me. So uh, life has changed quite a bit, but we can talk about that later, so... Excellent. Thank you both for, uh, for introducing yourselves. Um, I guess we'll just jump right in. Again, you should see for folks who are present here, uh, we've got the chat function open. And so if you've got questions, um, feel free to type that in there or let me know within the chat. I think you can um, specify directly to me if you'd like to ask your question live. Um, we're, we're open to it. Um, but we'll start off with uh, this overarching question because of the fact that it's, you know, partly slow food hosted event. Um, like I mentioned earlier, Slow Foods ethos is good, clean, and fair food. And so, um, you know, food that is good for you, food that tastes good, food that's clean for the environment, fair pricing for producer and consumer and bridging that gap. And I'm just curious um, if you can start off by talking about the ways in which um, you understand um, these principles of good, clean, fair, how they work in your respective businesses. I know, Avishar, you were part of Slow Food Columbus um, back in the day. Um, and so, you know, what does that mean to you? And, you know, also add that layer that we don't expect restaurants to be perfect. And so we're now adopting this phrasing, we as in Slow Food Columbus is adopting this phrasing of slow food friendly, right? So we're trying to reach these attainable goals and hopefully they're attainable things, but we recognize they're not the easiest. Um, so whoever would like to, to start. Go ahead, <laughs> you can go oh, first. Okay. <laughs> well, um, so La Chatelaine, uh, it's, when it started, uh, all the recipes are from my grandparents. Um, so everything is that, there's no recipes of um, American, I'm sorry to say, but um, when we came to America, my mom really didn't like the bread, uh, didn't like anything here, because um, it is a big culture shock when you come over from Europe. So my dad being a food engineer um, and my brothers being in school in Europe, uh, when we decided to open the restaurants, I was just 11 years old, so very, I didn't have any say in anything. Uh, they wanted to do clean, good French food. Now, there's two types of French food. You've got the what is on my plate, kind of like little things where they serve with chopsticks and or they use little pinchers to put on. Or there's the real French cooking, like in Normandy, which is where my father is from. So we decided to do bread and croissants and pastries. Um, at La Chatelaine, everything is made from scratch. Uh, we don't grow our own vegetables, but we do grow our own herbs. Um, the meat comes from OSU Farms, which is right down the street. So you can look at the cows that we have. Um, the beef for the beef bourguignon, the Indochine, um, all of that comes from OSU. We've always partnered with them. Um, every the yeast, the the flour is American is American because you can't we can't get the French flour, um, but we make everything from scratch every single day. In Upper Arlington is the the hub. So um, when you come to the UA store, you can see it back there. Um, so we're very proud that we make everything from that. Uh, a lot of places are very 
surprised when they come into the restaurant and see that all our soups are made. We cut everything by hand, our soup bases. Um, so we're very proud to be clean. I can tell you exactly what is in everything that we make. Um, we're also FDA controlled. So the FDA is no joke. And uh, so they, you know, make sure that we're doing all the correct stuff. But it's pretty, pretty awesome that um, people always come in and say, holy man, like this is, we never thought that this is what we do. But um, we're very proud of that. And we even cut our own lettuce. Like, you know, that's not even seen anymore. We don't even buy bags. So um, pretty cool about that. Um, like I said, my dad's a food engineer. So when he first, um, when we first started the restaurants, he um, was one of the first places or first restaurants in Ohio to do sous vide, um, which is very popular now uh, due to the Food Network and things like that. But uh, we were, um, the first we had to teach my father had to teach the health department what this machine did uh, it's a big vacuum machine and you know we have uh, special thermometers and uh, when we make our batches of food it's all preserved in these bags with no preservatives um, and everything is the same quality and it's just a great way of cooking you don't have waste you don't have loss you know everything is amazing um, on that so clean is uh, also very important with the sous vide and things like that. So pretty proud of that. And you can come and sometimes on Instagram, we post about that and it got us through um, COVID. I mean, we sold all our dinners that way and you just take the bag of Vivo Guignon, you put it in the water and it's the best quality that you can have. So um, good clean fun over here. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you for sharing that. I mean, I, I love the, I'm very biased, but I love the food at Chatelain and you know, it's, it's that kind of history. It's, it's uh, the kind of non-pretentiousness. It's not you're, you're sharing with the world. This is what we've got on the menu, right? It's um, it's wholesome food, which is wonderful. Um, um, before we move on to Avishar to respond to the question, I do see that Jessica is able to join us. So I want to um, at least uh, ask her to unmute and um, introduce herself, and and then we'll uh, return to the question. So, Jessica, if uh, you're able to unmute. Yes. Okay. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Hey. Thank you for Hi. joining us. <laughs> um, yeah, we're just, uh, we've had um, Charlotte and Avishar just introduce themselves. So if you could just introduce yourself briefly, um, what's your role in the restaurant? Um, you know, where do you fit in Columbus? And then uh, you can respond to the other questions you've got. Uh, well, I'm the manager of Casuala since she's my, my, my cousin. We, we both work in the restaurant. Uh, her name is Yasmin. Her father is the one who started the restaurant. Um, I'm not really good at talking with camera and I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. And I, and I laugh a lot when I'm nervous too. Um, well, we started a restaurant in 2006. My family immigrated, well, I got, I immigrated in 2002 and I went to high school here. And then we just, I have a dream to have a restaurant and we uh, work a lot to save enough money to open the restaurant. We want to do more like about like um, the food from where we're from. We are from Guadalajara, Jalisco. It's the best city in Mexico, just saying. We have <laughs> there, we have really good food. It's just, it's just the best place in Mexico. Um, I don't know what to say. something. <laughs> So how we started was like they I saw them work hard a lot and it was like it was like we were it was like just amazing to see how accomplished we were because our old spot it was very small, only one spot. And now we have food trucks, we have three big locations. So it's just good to see it grow. That's wonderful. And again, I'm glad that you um that you're both now able to join us this evening despite how busy and popular um, y'all have gotten. Uh, so we'll return back to Avishar. Um, as Avishar is speaking, um, Jessica, and then was that Jasmine or Yasmin? Or... Yeah. Okay. Um, the question to think about is how your food on some level um, represents good, clean, fair, however you define what that is. So we'll have um, Avishar respond to that and then we'll turn it back to you. Oh, I'll respond faster. So I'll you back. Um, it's a... Uh... <laughs> 
good clean and fair has always been difficult. Uh, I didn't grow up in the restaurant industry. Uh, no one in my family really is in restaurants. My mom is, I mean, she feeds us all the time. Uh, but the biggest inspiration, I guess, that I've had is, is her cooking and her cooking is anything out of the fridge, basically. Uh, when they came here from Bangladesh, uh, both my mom and my dad emigrated, uh, emigrated away. I guess you could say they were refugees. Uh, we're Buddhist and Bangladesh is a Muslim country. And it was East Pakistan initially. So they kind of fleed and came over here for better opportunities. Uh, and when that happened... No one really know. Like I'm confused for being Indian all the time still to this day, uh, but it's a very kind of humble culture. So we've always used and preserved things. Um, there's we don't throw anything away ever, like ever. And that's kind of like that how, how all of my cooking started. When I went into a restaurant for the first time, I was just shocked by how much is thrown away and wasted. Um, and for the longest time, like you know, this is one of the few times that I'm now in charge of my own business, so I can make the decisions. But historically, it's been like the finer the dining gets, the more you throw away. Um, you'd have like a little meat bucket and you'd feed your staff, of course, but it just, I don't know, I don't find it very practical. I worked in a couple of Michelin places in New York City, and I really liked like the precision and all these awesome things. But to make something pretty comes at a cost. And that means like you throw things away. It doesn't matter how sustainable the product is. If you're throwing it away, it's a waste. Like if you try and farm everything properly and you just pitch it out the back door, then I have a problem with that. Uh, so I always try and try and buy the best that I can afford. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's not the best out there it's not like you know a5 wagyu but uh i try to utilize every part uh to keep costs down because you know fine dining for me growing up was going to longhorn and you know i had to order something that was under ten dollars and it had to be well done i figured figure this out by reading and watching tv and stuff and um you know i think there's a food right now is in the better best place it's ever been uh, honestly i think the way that people are approaching it and how open people are to trying new things is something that i never thought i would see uh in, in america or even in ohio like i remember going to wild oats back at the time and they had like yeah. this thing called they had this thing called sushi and i was like oh raw fish you know like gross that was that was me you know that, that was the same guy that said that now it's like you can get it at kroger so like i think we've come <laughs> a long way in uh, in supporting one different cultures and i think different cultures uh, have different views on how to utilize products so what would we waste to one person would be something that we use all the time lobster was once considered a food that you would you couldn't feed someone more than twice a year because it was inhumane and like look at it now so it's a uh, uh, I think more awareness uh, is what I try to do with my guests. Uh, when, when I was over at service bar, we would serve things the way that they were supposed to be. I'd serve it on the bone, um, you know, and I'd serve things with traditional, like even Laotian flavors with a lot of fish sauce and a lot of like shrimp paste. Like, And what I found was really cool was that people are starting to like it. And I never thought it would be that way. I'm kind of like excited to see that I don't have to like, you know, like this entire time was involved in like, hey, you know, hold back, you got to make it look this way. But now we're going back to the story sold with food and how it brings together instead of like how we need to do things or how we need to present things. Um, so I work locally whenever I can, uh, but honestly, like I'm not getting local fish. So, you know, like I don't want, I don't want like Lake Erie lobster. That's not going on the menu. Obviously there's, there's gotta be some middle ground here somewhere. Right. Um, uh, at service bar, we made a thing is if we can make it, we would. And we went as far as like, we use the air in our distillery to make our own sourdough. And, you know, for a year and a half, it sucked. And we had to put up with that. Like it was not good, but our goal was to say, what if we don't have to buy yeast anymore? Or what if we used our spent grand extruder on pasta? Um, yeah, it costs a lot of money to buy this machine, but once the machine was bought, it enabled us to do more with less. And I always think like some of the best food that I've ever had is like, you know, it's like the part, it's like burnt to the bottom of the pan or like that outside piece that people want to throw away. Like that's the stuff that I like to go for. And now that I'm in a position that I can produce food for people to, to buy, like I'd like for them to be able to have that same experience. Cause I think those are like the experiences that to go for. And more often than not, they end up being sustainable practices. Um, and it just involves full animal utilization, uh, it's been a bit of struggle for a while, but I'm excited to see that now I can, like, for instance, that service part the biggest thing that I was able like happy to do is I served a uh, half duck dish. Um, and when I grew up in Columbus, it was so hard to sell duck unless it was confit or unless you did a, a seared rare breast with New York. Like there was like two preparations you could have a duck. You could never serve the whole thing. You were like, oh, I don't want to eat that part of it. Uh, but we served it and we went complete high 90s. We went like we boiled the thing. We used the stock. We used the liver. We used every part of the duck. And we sold out of it like all the time to the point where I could get a better duck. And I was using D'Artagnan uh, out in, in New York city. I used, I was using their, uh, their Rohan duck and it's, it's like an awesome duck. And it was so cool because that was the first time in my life that I could serve a product that I was proud to be able to afford to get in. Cause that stuff's really expensive, but when people are willing to pay the price, I can increase the quality. Like I don't try and rip people off. It's just like things cost more money now. So if people are willing to spend the money, I'm excited to spend it here too, to enable better experiences. Cause you know, I didn't taste well until like five years ago. It's like, all these things are new to me too. So I'm no different. I'm just trying to learn. And like, it'd be really cool. Like we're talking about Columbus being a food city. If I can continue to do these things in the restaurant and say, Hey, let's try this thing from here. And if it's good enough, we can get it in and start, start the process of sourcing. And more often than not, when you do that, the person that specializes in one thing is a lot better than the person that does everything. So I try and find the person that's like, I'm the best at this. So I'm going to talk to you. 
how can I afford to sell this? Uh, does it support your family? Is that why it costs so much? Or is it something that you're just doing because, you know, you want the clout behind it? And if something that seems sustainable and there's no fishy practices and they don't abruptly mention that this is what we're doing, like I find it better. Um, and I found like five or six people, you know, and I, I keep finding more and more, but it's really cool to have like a list of purveyors rather than just one that does everything. But it all, goes back, it, it all goes back to flavor. Like if it doesn't taste good, like, yeah. I'm sorry, but if it's a local product that sucks, I don't think that should be supported either. Like it's just because it does it's just enabling bad practices. Right. It's all about trying to find, like you said, the, those people who may know the, the need to, to be that catalyst to bring all those different things together. And I think that's a really cool part. And for those who have um, participated in like our annual um, Shake the Hand That Feeds You dinner, we have these different experiences where we're running behind the scenes, getting ingredients from one particular vendor that's supporting us and taking these other things and meshing them all together. So um, that definitely speaks to that to that story. Um, so Jessica, I'll turn it back to you. Um, how would you describe, <laughs> or, or to your cousin, whoever is more comfortable speaking, um, how do you understand the food that you're serving at Cazuela as, as something that is good, clean, and or fair for the consumer? Okay, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, we try to keep our food to be uh, fresh. A, a lot of the things that we make, uh, we, we make it every day. Um, we train our employees to, like, we have, we all have to go with the health department classes for the level one and two and three, so it's still, still. And uh, we try just to get things for the, the, lo the local produce companies. Um, Nala thinks we will, the produce, yeah, but the other ones are, it's more hard to do it. Right now, we cannot like um, have a, it's hard to find things because a, a lot of places are out of uh, things, so we have to substitute things. So it's been kind of trouble for us to get have everything from our menu except fish menu because a lot of, a lot of times we don't have what we need to make it. Um, okay. um, she needs to help me. I told her she needs to kind of help me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, well, it sounds it sounds like um you're 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 dealing with um like an inventory kind of issue, right? So you yeah, have yeah. all of these ingredients and these recipes that you'd like to share, but it's difficult to find um, the things that you need to actually make that happen, right? So how do you, how do you um, bring that taste of authentic Jalisco cuisine um, in your in your restaurants? What is it that you focus on, or what is it that you do? So. Uh, we focus all our food from the recipes from Guadalajara, so that's how we be authentic. Like all of our recipes, they're never copied. They're actually from my dad. All the recipes, so that's how we make it focused on. And he's from Guadalajara. He's been born in Guadalajara, so he knows a bit of what of the authenticity. Um, our main, but we don't. We try to switch up our menu for. Like, we'll do french fries for people who just want, you know, something American. We have chicken fingers, but then we also have our authentic side where we have the tacos, the barbacoa soup. Um, we just have the pozole, um, tamales. So we just try to get our recipes from where they were with. Okay. Which sounds very much like, um, Charlotte, what you're, what you're, um, what the restaurants are doing, right? Taking these family recipes and to an extent, I was taking this experience from your, your parents and infusing that in your food. Um, Charlotte, I'm curious for uh, Charlene, do you have this similar kinds of issues with um, not having particular ingredients or has that been an issue for, for the restaurants as well? Um, well, uh, we had a lot of run-in with flour. Um, and then of course we all know butter, eggs, it's the price is insane. Uh, our lettuce, because we get romaine and green leaf um, in cases fresh, and that the romaine case typically ran $25, maybe $30 if there was a drought in Arizona or California. Um, a case of romaine now is about $80. 
Um, so it's like, it's, it's total insanity. Um, and I mean, we, like we said, we receive the fresh and we cut it and we have, like Abishar was saying, like, we have a waste, you know, we can't use like the, I mean, we can, but we, then the salad is no good for our Caesar salad that's so popular. So yeah, we're running into issues. Um, now it's better. Uh, it was really difficult because when we did carry out, all the carry out containers were pushed. You know, the only thing that was left was the really expensive kind that's like super good for the earth. So, but we ended up buying it because um, that's all that was available. So now that's a good clean thing that we do. Um, <laughs> we have more styrofoam. Uh, we have great paper containers, um, but it's a struggle every week when we do our ordering, we have to to call our, prov our providers and we work, we've had, we're really proud since we've been open for 32 years, we have the same people that we've had since the beginning. So they work with us, um, but it, that's a huge, huge cost. And I think that's where a lot of restaurants are raising their prices. Obviously everything is raising now, but um, it's ridiculous. Like a, a, a plastic cup to, to take away was usually a penny. Now it's 12 cents, you know? So you're like, oh, it's just so, they, ugh. So every day we're like, oh, and we're, we're like everyone here, you know, Jessica and Avatar, we're family run. The theme here is we're all coming from our family recipes, our family, um, you know, and we don't have partners behind us. We don't have, you know, we're not the chain restaurants or whatever goes on here in Columbus, like some places, like we don't have any backings, like it's, it's our pocket but we do it and we do it with a smile and every day we wake up and we eat that cost or we try to raise our prices. Like we didn't raise our prices for two years. You know, I go to Giant Eagle and, you know, buy a avocado and it's like $5, you know, and like, you know, fresh guacamole. She, Jessica should know it's yeah. very expensive, but we're going to pay because we're going to support small businesses and family businesses and it's homemade and, just eat it. Don't take it to go. Eat it. Sit down. Have two margaritas or a cup of coffee that he makes. Have a shower here. He makes the best coffee. Really shitty coffee, but I mean, so many crappy coffee. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting better. And, you know, that's why it's so so important. Thank you for doing this seminar um, because we are family-owned businesses and we're on our own, and we couldn't do it without the support of our community. But no, yeah, I the costs are insane. And I think that's a good, a, a great line among the three of you, this idea of family. And when we talk about slow food, it's, it's this notion of conviviality and the relationships we're creating with the people who are providing these ingredients and these services for us. Um, and then again, that relationship that you're having with your own customers. Um, yeah. With that in mind, I'm curious from all three of you, from all four of you, how do you define um, or can you define the Columbus food scene and what it looks like? And clearly yeah. we have very different kinds of restaurants here, the family style that um, you all are, are speaking to. We also have the chains and everything in between. Um, if you ever would like to start, but this question again, and then of what, what does Columbus food scene look like? Is there that, um, how, how do you describe it? I can, if I can, may I please, uh, when we came in, in the early 90s here, um, the reason why we came to Columbus was, A, my mom is from Belgium. So Belgium, uh, the temperament of weather is a lot like Columbus. So she really loved it here. You have the four seasons, you have spring, fall, you know, a lot of rain. Um, so um, so she, they loved it here. And then Columbus, like Avatar, you've lived here your whole life too. Uh, it's, it, it's a, it was a food um, test market. So it was New York, California, and then us. Wendy's, McDonald's or Wendy's White Castle, a lot of places started here. Um, and we're a huge chess market. We were a huge chess market, like the McRib. Everyone eats a McRib once in a while. It started here in Columbus. We are one city that was always a place where they could launch new items. And that's because you have Ohio State is very um, diverse. You have a lot of people who live in the same zip code that are generations of family. So we're really, really diverse. So when we came here, there wasn't very crazy food scene, especially in the French department. We have the refectory, which is a wonderful place to go for that other side of French cooking. Um, but man, it boomed. And now you have a authentic ethnic different types of places. Um, you've got a lot of family places, which is awesome. Little hole in the walls that you can go to. And 
now you have like these little communities like Worthington, Clintonville, up Arlington slowly getting there, Dublin slowly getting there, but like you've got all these packed short north is intense. You know, you've got little places that are really up and coming and it's great. People in, in Columbus love to eat and a lot of things get tested here. So if it works in Columbus, it works nationally. It's a thing my dad always said, and it's true. He did so much research. Huh. You know, the French man. <laughs> um, Avishar, Jessica, how would you describe the Columbus food scene? Please go ahead, Jessica. You can go first. <laughs> you have a different perspective? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go last, yeah. <laughs> no, I have to say perspective. I was, yeah. I figured we could just change the order up to keep things interesting. Since instead of one, two, three, it'd be like one, three, two. You know, it's it's a psychology that I got from the Ohio State University. I got a bachelor's of science in psychology, so I'm testing it out. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I remember when um, I got here in 2002. It wasn't a a lot of Mexican restaurants. We it's a lot of people knew about Mexican food, but not a lot like right now. A lot of people know they knew like text mix They knew a lot of text mix So I remember that um, the only real Mexican restaurant that was in Columbus, it was the one on the west side, the Plaza Tapatia, and still there now they switched to another location. It's huge. But I remember the only place that you can go and find like really good Mexican food because it Oh, all the other restaurants they were Tex Mex. So it was more like burritos and chimichangas, hard tacos. So, but I feel that, I feel like 10 or 15 years from now, we switch and change a lot of the Mexican food. Like now you can actually find a lot of good Mexican food everywhere that you go in Columbus. And I think it's growing really fast too. It's kind of crazy how it's growing really fast. Um, I remember when we when we opened a restaurant, it took us a while for people to come and try us. My uncle used to make us to sit down so people think that we that we have customers. So we pretend to be customers. <laughs> that was kind of like, hey. Um, I rem remember the first thing that we sold in the restaurant was a towel, a, a coffee. And we didn't have cast for coffee. So we're like, where are we gonna put the cup? <laughs> and uh, so it, for us, it was a really, um, it took us a while to learn the business and uh, make people to actually like what we're offering. Because it took like a lot of people just ordering like, yes, that's my food. And it was like, you know, we have all these good, good things that you can try. But now people like really, like they know more about authentic Mexican food that they did before. So they help us a lot to grow and to actually Trying to try to make different things still that they that would think that they would like. Um, I remember we put the um agua de horchata, the horchata water, and of course, and nobody and nobody wanted it. Like, you know, it's free. You can try it. Like nothing, you know, nothing you. But now they love it. It's like oh, nice. So um, I feel that every every year, people are more open to try different things. <laughs> no, that's great. So, yeah, so you're, you're talking yeah. then about this, um, the, this teaching, right? That you have to have, you have to, we have to teach and inform yes. the consumer and more and more, whether it's through media or through the work that all of you are doing, um, there's a more open acceptance. Um, Avishar, have you also seen that through your time living in this, in this area? Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. Uh, I've traveled to many cities uh, and I've traveled to various countries because my parents are big into getting us to go and see things and I didn't really appreciate it until I got older but uh, now that I look back at it it's interesting that no matter where I've been I still feel like Columbus is home uh, I spent some time in New York City I spent some time in Chicago I love the cities I love the, the concentration of culture that's that's available in those places but I think Columbus is unique in that we don't have a culinary identity and that's a good thing like I don't know what I am I'm Bengali American I was born in Columbus Ohio my parents came from Bangladesh and I like to make Chinese food so what what does that say about me I don't know what it says but what that says because Columbus isn't like hey we're we're Johnny Marzetti city like you know like that's where Johnny Marzetti came from Columbus so uh we don't have to identify with a certain food we're more open to having kind of a sprawl and uh 
you know, like I remember back when Anthony Bourdain was around, he had a little quote about Columbus and he said that it's, uh, it's a shitty city separate of strip malls separated by Applebee's. And, you know, like, I think that's true, but that's the coolest thing in the entire world because I can go to a strip mall, get authentic Vietnamese food, get some Somali food, get my hair cut, and I'm good for the day. Like, you can't do that anywhere else. I, I like having to, like, kind of search and go to these places to find stuff because what's cool is a lot of the people, like, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of everyone, um, <laughs> but I would say that what I see in a lot of restaurateurs and people that have restaurants is they didn't start to open up a restaurant they wanted to share part of their home with the community so they said hey, i mm -hmm. want to cook this food because i can't find it here and then they opened up and now you have places that have been around like that for many many like dozens of years tens of years 30s or decades and and they're they originally started from this idea that hey this isn't here right now can we make it um and yeah they can make it they can make it in a reasonable price they can make it affordable and you know the community will support them and people are now trying and what's cool now is it seems like uh like about 20 years ago, we'd go to, you know, we'd go to pockets. Like I'd go and get Sichuan cuisine or I'd go to these like restaurants. We go to like Thai Palace back before. So Lemongrass used to be called Thai Palace and it was down at the end of Morris Road. And they had these authentic chairs that you could sit on that were like, they weren't like you'd sit in the ground and you'd sit back and it'd be like you were in Thailand. It was, it was amazing. And we used to go there every week. Um, yeah. It was, it was like crazy to see like, like if that was still that way now, it would be a lot more popular than it was back then. But it was always, it's always available. But now you're seeing more and more people taking chances. Um, and it's not like, hey, we're going to be this three Michelin star restaurant city. Like, I don't think, I don't personally, I, I mean, I don't mind if it goes that direction, but I don't think it should. I think what's cool is like people that uh, want to do well and want to share their food with others and have a story behind it and have, uh, you know, they really love what they're doing and they love the experiences and the bridges, bridges the gap. Columbus is happy to receive that. And they do genuinely. Uh, we are a very good, excuse my language, we are a very good bullshit detector as a city. When people bring stuff into Columbus and say, I want to show you how we do it at the city, every restaurant that's tried that has failed. They're like, oh, this is, we're from New York, so we know how to do stuff. That does not work here. Uh, what does work is if people actually care about what they're doing and they have some authenticity behind it. They like if they care enough, then you get an audience, you get people. And I mean, it's not in every case, but more often than not, it seems to it seems to be working pretty well. Um, and it's tough. It's not easy, but it's like at the end of the day, like you can't put on a show your entire life. You have to make the food if the food is good and you have a story. It'll it'll go on. You don't have to try. It's like that part you don't have to try on. Um, and I think that's like, that's one of the neater things that I'm seeing more and more of uh, in Columbus is uh, my entire time people are like, hey, where can you eat in Columbus? And I was hesitant to recommend anything because, you know, even my own family food is like, some of it is pretty strong and I don't know if my American friends would like it. So I would be, I'd say, hey, yeah, don't eat such one peppercorn because it's going to numb your mouth and kill you. But now I can say that people are like, oh, I like the spice. And it's so cool that for me, uh, growing up, I eat very spicy. When I started cooking, I was told to stop eating spicy because it would interfere with the guest palate. That's the thing that was objectively told to me in three restaurants that I worked at. And now it's like my guests come in and say, make it as spicy as you can. And I make it as spicy. And like their eyes are watering. And, you know, and I, I know it as well as I did that burrito challenge. I know how spicy that can be. <laughs> I, I ate it. It was, it, it affected me for two days. But it, it was very, very good. You can do those things and people are willing to try. And I think like in a lot of other cities, that's not the case. But in Columbus, it, it's definitely the case. I mean, we, we are a city of a lot of people that, came to Columbus or people's families came to Columbus. <laughs> and for one reason or another, maybe it's because it's Ohio State University, maybe it's because it's a test market. We're all here. Uh, what we want to do is we want to contribute, not copy. And I think that's really cool. Yeah. That's a, that's a great way to put it. And, you know, from the more academic -y food anthro side of me, I'm, I'm thinking of this notion of taste of place and this kind of social terroir that we're creating where it's the people that are very much determining what that taste actually is, or you're bringing all of your different experiences to this location um, and kind of vetting and seeing, you know, yes, this belongs here, this doesn't, or we'll support you in, in this process. And I think that's that's really cool to be seeing in, in all three of your cases. Um, I do want to remind our, our, our guests here, if you do have questions, please do drop them in the chat or raise your hand in the function and um, we'll have your question asked. Um, we did have one come from Rick Livingston, um, who says that uh, the longevity of La Chatelaine is really remarkable. Um, what changes have you seen? How has La Chatelaine changed? Um, and I think just slightly different than the question I just posed with, how is Columbus, um, what does the food scene look like and how has that changed? How have each of your businesses essentially changed since you first started? Do you, do you want me to start, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, contrary I to Avishar's statement, 123, 132, um, the question's posed directly to, to Charlotte, so we'll have her go there and then... Um, Everybody. Um, We'll change the order. Um, well, um, yeah, Abishar and Agneska made a great point because when we first opened, I mean, my mom, who still doesn't speak very well English, I mean, you, her accent's like total insane. So, um, you know, we opened the doors of Lane Avenue in 1991, in April of 1991, and 
uh, the biggest belief for my father and my mom and my brothers when they opened La Chatelaine was to be in a community. We're the heart of the community. So all our buildings are in the heart of each location because it's the community that we're feeding, not anybody else. Um, so when the doors opened that day, people were like, who the heck is this lady, you know, with this crazy French accent going, bonjour, and big and blonde. And, and, um, and I am so proud of her to do that. Um, these people are like, what the heck? They've never seen anything like this. It's cafeteria style line. You've got my oldest brother, who is kind of a very big Polish man making bread, very scary, total French chef, you know, with the bread. And you've got my other brother who's like totally opposite and, and crazy fun. So we started off with this little bakery uh, and serving spaghetti, my mom's spaghetti sauce and people going, spaghetti is not French, you know, and my mom was like, ah, it's so good, you put Swiss cheese on it. So we educated the population of Upper Arlington, a little bit of Worthington, what bread is, artisanal, you know, um, we feel like we taught a little bit the community on who we are uh, and what French Normandy, health, uh, French family food is. Um, but the longevity is the contact with the customer. That's why we have made it through these crazy years, through the anti-French war, you know, in the 90s where they were pouring, you know, wine, French, it was all, you know, it was freedom fries and, and then they had COVID and, but we have lasted this long because we love our customers. And there's not one La Chatelaine that you can't go into at any time of the day without a family member there. We're always up on front. I worked up front just like anybody else. My employees are not my employees, they're my family. We have held on to about 25 of our employees. You know, we had to cut our hours and a lot of them moved on, but you know, our core employees have been with us for more than 10 years. Um, so our employees and the way that we push ourselves to make sure that we take care of our customers and, and authentic food and quality food. And you can come see in the back of the house um, and just interacting in the community, that's why we're there. Um, and we just are very proud to be part of anyone's life. You know, you come in, you're coming into our home, you know, La Chardelaine, I know when I was little, I saw my parents put those beams up and the blood that was spilled on the floor from sanding the floors and the blood, sweat and tears, you know, everything was done. <laughs> My dad cutting off the balls off the top of the chairs. That's why they have like not smooth. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but on the top of the chairs, I remember those things. So when the customer comes in, we say big bonjour. You know, I'm a big I'm a big fan of walking into a place and I'm greeted. I usually greet the employee when I go somewhere because I'm always saying hello to everyone before they can even greet me. But welcoming into our home, feeding them with the best food we can, you know, and and um and just being part of their lives every day. Um, that's the longevity and the working hard, you know, working very, very hard and never, never stopping. And we're a family, so we gotta, gotta keep on working. Thanks for so. sharing that. Um, I, I think <laughs> I'll transition to Jessica then. How, how does that, um, how does that relate to your experience at Cazuelas? How, how is it that Cazuelas has lasted um, for as long as it has so far? We, we, yes, honestly, we work a lot. It was a part of my life that I didn't have any social life. I was just at a restaurant working, 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 working. <laughs> um, <laughs> my, we, we're trying to, um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. I have my son in here and we he introduced he just like tell say hi. Hi. <laughs> yeah, he he wanted candy, so it just, I just got lost with <laughs> But like you said, it's it's all it's all family, right? That's that's the, <laughs> the story here. <laughs> yeah, he loves to use the phone and play with it. But he, um I try to teach him that he needs to see people, so he do it well for like 30 seconds. For 30 minutes and that's it. He's more for 30 minutes. <laughs> but what was the question again? 
Um, how is it that, how would you explain how um, Cazuelas has been able to last and, and grow these many years since you first started? I feel because we, even though it's kind of tough to find employees, it was before 2020, we were, we, it was at least a little bit tough because we have, we're on campus. So a lot of our employees, they come and go because they, they go to college and then they done college and then they, they leave. But the last, the past year, it was really crazy. It was just really great to find somebody to work. So we just, we just work a lot, trying to make fresh food. And we basically work between 12 to 13 hours sometimes, just to be able to get our summit open. Um, we, I feel that we just keep trying, trying, trying to, to, trying to do different food, trying to make that the customer happy and feel happy, welcome there. Um, we, uh, we have, we have, I guess, we're special sometimes and, and that brings people in. We just always thinking about what to do to make people come in. Uh, 2020 was, I think, it was tough for everyone. It helped us a lot that we had a food truck, so it helped us a lot to survive. But I remember there was a point where we were, we were, we were thinking to close the restaurant because it wasn't enough business at first. So we just, you know, we just keep working, working, working. And the good thing about like working with family, that sometimes it's bad, but sometimes you don't have to pay them a lot. You know, now you work, you, you, you can just work and the world will give you food. That happened at first for us. So, in the and she used to be a host when she was a, when she was a kid. <laughs> yeah, so I've been there for seven years, and I used to be a host. So now I'm here. I'm a server now, and I work in the food truck. But what has kept us, I think, is since we're on campus, you have to get the college students' interaction. What the college students are into now is they're into a lot of social media. So that's what we have been doing. Like, we post a lot to get their attention because that's, that's what we are based on. Like all of our customers are mostly college students. We have to have that interaction with them and make sure for us, we have to post on social media, get their attention. Uh, we'll do like specials and then we'll do different foods to just get people in. But the pandemic was very hard for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it's it sounds like um, to to recap that that sec that segment, it sounds like you're the the Cazuelas has been able to survive because you all care so deeply, right? That no matter what the obstacles are, you're having to adapt, you're having to put all of that time and energy to keep it alive. And I think that's a, a really great, um, really great story of, of of just commitment to the craft that you all are committed to. Um, Avishar, the the same question to you. Uh, I'm curious then what you know, taking what Charlotte and Jessica and, and Yasmin are talking about, how do you see Joya's being here for 20, 30 years to come? Or, or do you want I, it to last that long? I honestly, I mean, I, I, it's got my mom's name on it, so I guess it has to at this point. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, Joya's is kind of just, uh, it was one of the, the things that, uh, it was a lesson learned for the pandemic is the way that I describe it. Uh, in all of our lives, and we've all been from th different backgrounds, and we've dealt with a lot of things. Our jobs as chefs and owners has been to solve problems. And most times, we can solve problems, right? We can go and pull some money out of our account. We can pay this person in advance. We can pay them under the table. We can go and get somebody out of jail. If need be. Whatever we do, like our job is always to solve problems. Uh, on March 15th, uh, the day after my birthday of 2020, uh, I was in the dish pit doing dishes because I didn't have a dishwasher. Uh, and I was told that uh, I had to let my entire staff go. And, you know, that's a very hard thing for me to accept because every day we bust our ass. Like, we don't get a lot of money. Like, we do it for the interaction with the people. And they're saying, now you can't interact with people. Uh, you can't as a restaurant. You can't have people. People come to us for safety. They come for, to us for happy. The reason that I cook isn't because of, like, hey, I, I want to get famous or get rich or something. It's the reason that I cook is because it, it brings us together. And no matter what, like, no matter how bad of a day you're having, maybe you can take a bite out of something and forget about the problems for five minutes. That's all it takes. It's a little bit of happiness, a smile. If the food can make you do that, A+. Plus. Uh, and we had, at service part, we'd worked so hard uh, and been through so many, like, bad times to try and get the staff and everyone on the same page to build something that we felt, like, comfortable that, to say that we could present. And, you know, we all have imposter syndrome, so we don't never know where we're doing the right thing, but we're just trying to do, like, we want to make people happy. We want to stay 
relevant. We want to we want to embrace things. We created an Instagram account called Secret Kitchen Menu because we wanted to say like, hey, people will always look at their phone now at during dinner. So how can we encourage it in a way that goes, hey, we reward it because I do too. So like, what if we made an Instagram page that said this is the food that we want to serve? Like, and then people would get online and be like, cool. I can see that we get some people mad because they're like, we don't we use the internet things. Like, what's wrong with you? Why would you exclude us? We're not trying to exclusion. We were just like, hey, we wanted to address this as, as a thing. Is a we want to say relevant and part of social media and things like TikTok and Instagram is like you have to keep updating. And it's really hard. In one year, we put out over a thousand dishes, like a lot to put out a thousand different menu items. I, I still don't know how we did it. It was basically desperation, but it was one of those things that once we started, we had to we had to keep with every week seven new items not like every season, every week. And then when we're out, people are like, you're out. And I was like, yeah, that's a secret kitchen menu. So once it's out, it's out. And then we had to find something else. So that was kind of like the start of how we started to look at that. But that day when the pandemic hit, that one page, uh, it changed everything for us because we had a decision to make. The next day we said, hey, are we all done? Or are we going to try and make people happy? Because there's a lot of wrong that's about to happen in the world. Like there's going to be a lot of sad people. There's going to be a lot of people that have nothing and no options. They lost their jobs. They're sitting at home. They can't do anything. Can we still feed them? And we made a change from a place that does no carry out, no delivery, no platforms like that to only carry out and delivery. We took a big inventory of what we had in our walk-in. We gave whatever we could to our staff and we said, why don't we try and feed people what we have left and see if we can do something. Um, and our goal at that point was change from let's make the coolest, finest food that we can to how can we make people happy? Um, how can we support ourselves? Like first, like, you know, I want to be alive and, you know, like we want our staff. How can we support our staff? Um, then how can we support our community? Um, and so for us, it was, we, we like to feed people with food. So we, we kept feeding people. The second was like, we wanted to keep our staff, some of our staff employed. And we, we had our salary managers who happened to be in the kitchen. So we said, you know, we're a lot, we don't have, we can't have a server, but we can't have people making food. We just have someone at the front to find a way to solve this. Cause there was no, there's no guidelines. Like there was no training or anything that anyone could have done in the past to say, what are you like, what are you going to do? There was no relief at that time. There's no, there's no vaccine. There was no like, at some point we're like, can we just put glass? We didn't know what we're supposed to do. So you see a lot of chefs and you know, who, a lot of the chefs that, uh, that made it through, they, they made a decision to say, we want to do food because of the same reason we've always wanted to do food. Right. And we, we don't want to give up or we don't have the option to give up. And you see that in that moment, like you decide, do you really want to do this or not? Cause it really pushes you when you say, I can't solve the problem of, of this staff, but I can take the sales money. And if it's profit, I can build a fund for my staff. Or every Thursday, we can go to the church and feed everyone as much with the money that we get from the restaurant. Like that was kind of the model that we followed. And what I gained from that interaction is I've been cooking my entire life. I really didn't care to talk to people. I just wanted to make the best food possible. But when that happened, I realized that the reason that I do it is because I want to make people happy. Um, and that, that was a very important, important part of all of our, I mean, I think we've all gotten to that point at some point because you always want to be the best on one hand. And you're all like, I also want to do the right thing. Everything switched to like, what, what can we do? And we fed so many people. We fed uh, every Thursday at the church. We put 64 meals out for a year and a half. We fed all the first round responders. Uh, we put a fund together of over $10,000 for our staff in case anyone got injured or sick. Like, and we were able to do that because of our community. It was, there was nothing that was different other than the fact that we said, hey, we're going to do carry on delivery. You, you guys can pay whatever you want. Um, you know, this is the base price of the items. Anything that you do tip goes to our staff fund. And it was a solution that like really humbled all of us because we came to work every day for a different reason. We came because we wanted to make people happy. Like it wasn't like we came because like, oh, it's a job anymore. It's like, it's what we're doing. is important. We're creating a positive moment for somebody. And I think that's one of the few, like, you know, like no matter what, at the end of the day in the restaurant, like it's tough to get back to work. You, you know, you work 12, 14 hours a day, 16 hours, your plumbing goes out. You got to figure that out. You're, you're someone who quits like psychologically, like you have to be a psychologist, a plumber, an electrician. I use all of my degrees uh, currently in the restaurant on a daily basis, like, all the time. Like, and you know this, like, cause, cause what happens is something goes and they go now, now answer this question. And guess what? You don't know the answer, but you have to figure it out right then. You don't get to like get on the internet or Google. It's like someone is, there's a crisis right now, solve it. Uh, and I think like, it's cool to be able to do all those things and look back at it. And it's, there's some really tough days, some really dark days, but what brings us together is seeing our guests leave with a smile on their face, like knowing that we did good for somebody. Like, and you can't, there's nothing else you can, like, you can't feel bad about that. Right. Like you are putting a smile on people's faces. Like that's why I chose not to do medicine because when you're a doctor, people don't come to you and go, Hey man, doctor, I'm really happy to see you. Like I have this pain. I'm happy for you to do surgery. I mean, that's never the case, but with food, uh, you know, you have, you have a beer, you have a meal, you smile for a little bit. And I think like that's something that people sometimes complicate things too much. When we go back to that, that's why all these businesses succeed is because you made somebody's life better. And no matter what, yeah, you can make the food at home, but you go to a restaurant for an experience. Um, and to create an experience is a lot more than just like, hey, it's a perfect dish or it's just perfect service. It's it's something from inside and the owners and business proprietors, they know, like, that's what it takes, I think. But, you know, I'm young. I don't know what I'm doing, so. <laughs>
Great. Um, so we've hit the seven o'clock mark. Um, so just to let everyone know, we're planning on going till 7.15. So if you need to leave, I'm giving you the out now to, to bow out. Um, hopefully our panelists can still stick around though until that uh, 7.15 time. Um, but our next question, and again, if you have any other questions, uh, please can put them in the chat and we'll get through them as quick as we can. Um, but Deborah um, it does have a question for our panelists. Um, are there particular neighborhoods around Columbus that seem more open to supporting new ethnic restaurants? Um, is there anywhere or new, or by contrast, are there any places that might be a little bit more difficult um, to gain acceptance? So I guess this is more of a question of, um, we, were, we were talking earlier about what the Columbus food scene looks like, but how do we enter that or how do we diversify that or where is it difficult to do that? Um, and so I think using Avishar psychology, he should actually start first. Oh, dang it, uh, you got me. Fine. I haven't started with <laughs> <yet>. uh, I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm opening up a restaurant, a Bengali American cafe in Old Worthington, which is, is, if I'm not mistaken, is the oldest settlement in Ohio. So that's kind of crazy, right? It's like people are very accepting of me to go and do this thing that I don't even know what I'm doing, but I'm going to try and figure it out. Uh, I think it's kind of cool. Uh, what's more from my perspective as someone that's trying to open up a restaurant, uh, what's challenging now is working with developers yeah. and landlords. Because if you didn't get in early, like they always want a specific thing and they want a specific rent. Like it's really hard to find someone to say they understand what we go through and how we pay our bills. Like our margins five to 15%. So if we do a million in sales, wow, five to 15% is what could be profit that goes back into maybe fixing a toilet or maybe changing your hood out. It's not money that anyone walks away with. So it's always very, very it's, I think it's tougher to find someone to work with you because I think the people in Columbus, one thing that I've seen is they're willing to drive, like they're willing to go to places. Uh, but mm -hmm. Gahashi was in a, in a strip mall, like, you know, like for the longest time and people would go there all the time. People go to Bangkok Grocery and it's kind of far out there. Like, you know, all these places that have been around for a while, people will drive to. I don't think that it's a question as much of uh, if any specific neighborhood is away. It's more of a, from a business perspective, where can I be that I can afford to pay the bills and then uh, afford to have people come in because there's some attractive places. Don't get me wrong, like in the short run, there's some beautiful places that you could go into. But I just go like, how am I going to pay for that? <laughs> you know, like we're not rich people. So it's it's without having to say I need five investors and people to answer to. And then I have to do these things. Like those are some of the more challenging questions that I have to deal with because ultimately like the reason that I chose the Worthington spot, I wasn't even trying to find, go that as a location. I just walked in to buy some equipment. And I was like, wow, there's natural light in this kitchen. I haven't seen natural light in a restaurant in years. Like it's, I could get my vitamin D. I have a deficiency. So it, it was like, a, it was a, it felt like it was a really good neighborhood and environment. And like, I, I walked in and I was like, this is, this feels good. Um, and when you feel good, oftentimes people will come around and they'll ask questions. And when they go, Hey, we're excited to have you. Like, that's a weird thing. Cause I also worked in Delaware and I'm not that I, I worked in Delaware for a long time. Uh, Delaware uh, has similar-ish vibes to Worthington, except uh, they're not as, sometimes uh, it's very challenging. I'm not going to get too, too into it, but when we opened up Veritas over there, we, we opened up like a 25-seat restaurant where we were serving, we didn't know what the hell we were serving, but we thought we were going to go absolutely insane and, and do these like, you know, modern things, just pull from anything, just no, no holds barred, we're just going to be chefs. Uh, and <laughs> it was not initially well received, there were several nights and we had no guests whatsoever, and then Meanwhile, we had 1808, two down. I worked there too. And like, that's completely full. And you just go like, is it worth it? Like, what, what am I doing? Like, you know, what are, what are, so you always question, question things like that and in, in, involving givers, but then it gets to the point where one or two people you get that uh, in the case of Veritas up there, uh, Bear actually, the old, old president of Slow Foods uh, and Bethia Wolf from Columbus Food Adventures, they came up one day because they had heard something. They showed up and they wrote uh, like a five page article that they have changed our life because it gave us some hope. And that's all we really needed to be like, does one person care about what, like, like, you know, we've been working so many hours to try and put out this food, uh, try to make these things happen. Uh, can it be done? Uh, is it one of those situations where, like, you know, build it and they will come? I don't know if it's there yet, but I think the build it part is more important than the they will come part. They will come, but can you afford to keep your business going? Uh, that's what it comes down to because some places that make it impossible to succeed. Uh, your rent's going to go up in five years this much. Like, how are you supposed to, how are you supposed to capture that in, in rising prices? Like, those are the things that I wonder when I look into locations now is like, can I just find a spot that's, I can be happy at and not have to die working my job. That'd be nice. Awesome. It's a great uh, throwback to, to the work that Barry and Bethia and Andy and everyone else, um, also Food Columbus, um, you know, we hope to continue to be supporting all the different restaurants. And again, I'll just continue to express my gratitude for all of you for continuing to to be here and to be part of this um, particular uh, lecture series. Um, Charlotte, I'll turn it over to you. Do you have any um, particular neighborhoods that yeah. you find helpful? 
Oh, we're in the food service business. So our job is to make good food and to serve it well. Um, that's number one. So like, like Abishar was saying, like COVID, we didn't close because that's our job is to serve food. People are going to have to eat everywhere. So it doesn't, I don't think with La Chatelaine and the way that our family worked when we decided to open different places, it wasn't so much the neighborhood uh, location. It was, we needed, well, it is, it's the heart of the neighborhood. You're a bakery, you're a restaurant, you're, a, we're everything. We need it to be in the heart. So it doesn't matter what kind of neighborhood it is. It's just, it needed to be in the middle of the neighborhood. And then people will come if you give them good food quality food, a good price, a, an entertainment show, a personable, they're going to come back. So you can open up in Whitehall, you can open up in Gahanna, New Albany, all these places, Dublin, they're all different um, vibes. But if you open in a nice location, easy access, they're going to come to you. It's like, you know, that saying, if they, if, if they come to you, whatever, it's not my first language. Anyways, so, um, you know, like Dublin was a little bit weird because we actually um, bought land here in Westerville where the tea house used to be. North Star is there right now or is there. But that was we bought that land to build. Um, but Westerville was really difficult to work with us. Um, it was just a really hard place. You know, it's historic. Um, so they made my dad and mom very mad. So my parents sold the land and uh, opened up in Dublin, which is a whole other story because Dublin is very hard too. You know, they, my mom planted these trees and they didn't like the trees and then they made her take them out because they need to conform to the look. Um, so she was like, your bushes. It was a thing with her French accent. But, um, but no, it, you know, we are the heart of the community. It doesn't matter what community it is, just as long as you're there, you're serving, you make good food, uh, you know, uh, and make sure your quality and consistency. You know, McDonald's doesn't care. They open everywhere. But the McDonald's, you're gonna, the burger you're going to eat in California is going to taste just like the one here in Ohio. So you always need to make sure you're consistent and your quality. And, um, and if you're nice, sometimes you have to be mean, but nice, mostly. You know, because sometimes people are going to tell you what to do and how to do your job. And I'm like, I don't come to your house to tell you how to do your job. This is what do. Exactly. This is about it. You know? My uncle you says to me. Friends, they're going to help you out. You know? And, and we, you know, my mom has had some run-ins with some people and so have I. But we respect everyone who comes in and tells us. And we say, okay, no problem. You know? You know, the, the baguette. Oh, a baguette, by the way, you eat it within six hours. You don't eat it tomorrow. A baguette, you take, you buy it, you eat it for lunch, you walk home with it after your work, uh, because the next day is going to turn hard as a, as a lightsaber. You know, baguette is meant to be eaten right away. So when people would come back with their baguettes like two weeks later and be like, it's so hard, we'd be like, we don't use any preservatives. You don't, you must eat it. So that's the neighborhood thing. People will say, oh my gosh, I remember coming to La Chatelaine when it opened and your mom gave us tours and and taught us how to eat it, how to pronounce quiche. Quiche wasn't a thing back then. They say quiche, you know, or, you know, baguetti. You know, my mom said, oh, you know, so it's, it's that, it's that thing. And like, like um, the Jessica, like they're college. So they're fun and they have to be upbeat and social media. And then like we're community and Avishar is like, you know, we want the fanciest place they want you know, a little place that's vitamin D and that the community comes and, and enjoys his food. So, that's a lot of stuff, but. <laughs> um, and then uh, Jessica, uh, you've got, the, I, I sent the question earlier, but um, how difficult was it to get um, the restaurant going where you were? Or did you find it to be difficult in terms of choosing locations for Cazuelas or the, the food truck or the grill? Um, when we used to be in the small casolas, when they told us that they would like, destroy that, the, the, the whole block, make that huge, the huge apartments, we were kind of scared and devastated because that was the first house. So for a second, we were going to worry that we're not going to find a place to move. Um, so we were, all th we were all thinking to do like something else. But we got lucky that we find that place, like, basically it's a block away from where, where, where we are. 
And um, we were scared that the people would not would want a black to go to us, but because we were in all casualas for a really long time and, and it took us a while for them to come to to, to us. So it wasn't that hard for yes, yes to what oh, that what what one more street. Um so we I think we just been really nice to people, they like us and they love margaritas obviously so they call that too. Um <laughs> Got yeah. a gateway location. We were just uh, we were just testing it because we we didn't know we were gonna because we honestly we are really close. We're like, are we gonna lose business for one for one casuela? So what what's gonna happen? But my uncle heard that he loves to take risk, risk, risk. He always just risk it and see what happens. So that was his ammo. Like we opened one casuela in Cambridge. It didn't work, but we opened it. <laughs> We stayed there for two years, I think, for two years, yeah. We're like, no, it's just, we, it's not going to work. But yeah, he just loved to risk it, to see what, and like, he, he has his, um, in his mind, it was like, if we try a lot, it was, it's going to work. That was his, that, that was what he always said, like, you just have to try, you just have to work hard, you just have to make people happy, it's going to work out. So, that was his, his thing, right? Yeah, he's that, her dad. Yes, just for everything. That oh, we opened the food trucks because we were like, you know what, let's do it. We didn't know how to do it at all. We didn't know how to do it. All. Like, who to contact? What kind of permits we had to get? We didn't know anything. But we figured out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I might need to leave soon because we are getting busy right now. Sure. Yeah, and actually, on that note, um, we're just gonna we'll wrap up right now. Uh, uh, for for all three of you, if you have any, um, we've got three minutes here. If you have just a quick final thoughts for folks who are here, um, in the room, and for those who might watch this, um, what, what would you like people to know about you or your your business? Um. Well, for for us, like we we just want the people know to let them know that we we survived the pandemic, so that's a good news for everyone. And uh, we just try our best to um for people to try our food. And um, yeah, that's it. Sorry, I don't know what else to say. All right, no, that, that's good. Um, Charlotte, any final words? Just thank you for the years of support, letting us be part of your family, breaking bread together, you know. And um, anytime you stop by in any restaurant, I am the only one who doesn't have an accent. So everybody else in part of the family has one. So you know you're speaking to somebody from the family. So, you know, ask us anything. We support everybody. Um, and uh, thank you again for letting us have three generations of La Chatelaine and uh, we're not going to open up anymore because it's a lot of work. Um, but um, I'm excited to try you, Avishar. I'm excited to come have a margarita with you, Jessica. And, you um, should. And, yeah. I'm going to head over there right now, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I wish I had a margarita, like a sangria margarita. Yeah. My favorite. Ooh. And it's Taco Tuesday. Yeah, it so, is, yeah. <laughs> um, happy Taco Tuesday. But um, but thank you for supporting us. And you know, Columbus is the best city. It's the best state, Ohio. Um, and uh, and thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Um, and then Avishar, uh, any quick words? And then we'll um, we'll close out. Yep, nothing too crazy. I mean, I, I appreciate you all being here. Uh, honestly, like it's, I never thought that uh, choosing this career path, I'd ever get the chance to be able to like talk to people because I always keep to myself. Uh, and it's kind of weird that people are actually listening to me because like my family and my staff don't listen to me. So, <laughs> so <laughs> all right, go figure, you know, that's you, you do your best and never listen. But uh, I will say that, uh, I mean, to be objections, we're talking about slow food and the things that are in the future. I, all of us as business owners and restaurant owners, like we'll show the smile, but we're scared inside. It's really, it's a really tough time for all of us. Uh, so just bear with us. Like we're trying our best to figure out a way to make this work. There's a lot of things that are happening down the line that we don't have answers to. We're trying our best to figure it out. But know that sometimes like, you know, we're not, some things aren't 
you know, what they seem necessarily. So if something looks like it's not going right, we always want to hear it, of course, but just try and be patient with us. Cause you know, like yeah. we, a lot of us like, Hey, when, when the pandemic hit, we didn't close, like everyone else got some time to think about their lives and do whatever. Or maybe they lost their jobs, but we worked through it all. So like, we're really tired. You know, like all of us are very, we, well, all of us are very, very tired and we, we're going to continue to do it, but it's, we're just a little bit slower than we used to be, you know? Right. Well, on that, fighters. Note, yeah. fighters. <laughs> on that note, thank you to everyone um, for joining us.